with hope and grace fills the sky with new mercy each day we're alive we declare your glory jesus there's a joy that overwhelms our souls because we know our god is in control overflow
worship experience those that are in person and online you're probably thinking to yourself if you're new you're thinking why are these amazing people lifting their hands and worshiping through a song that says it's already done when everything in my life is undone incomplete delay after delay broken beyond repair what is it that's finished and done well I'm glad you asked because every promise that God has and made for you, it is already done. It is complete and we're rejoicing. When Jesus gave us the example of prayer, he says, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it already is in heaven. That was before the cross. So on the cross, guess what Jesus does? He, through his ultimate sacrifice, he secured every promise. He could secure every blessing. That means our healing, our strength, our joy, our redemption, our resurrection, our power, and our authority. It's been finished. It is complete. It is already done. Now what we must do, and this is why we sing these songs and preach the gospel every week, is we must now believe and receive that it's done. So this song just ignites our faith. That's why our hands are lifted. That's why you may see some tears this morning. It's because we're being reminded that I'm already healed. I'm already blessed. Provision is already there for me. It's already done. And that's what we want to do today. Our pastors and elders are here. We've been waiting all week to pray for you. I want to ask our pastors and elders to come to the front. And I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what you're facing. But we're just going to remind you that it's already done. 
And I know it may seem big, it may seem impossible, but your God is bigger, He is greater, and we just gonna take steps of faith today and believe that every promise and blessing is already done. Father, we thank you for the finished work of the cross. We celebrate it and we receive it today in Jesus' name, amen. Well, the aisles are open. Feel free to come to the front and receive prayer as we continue to worship.
at 7 p.m. where we gather for worship and then break out into our groups. It's completely free and without the hassle of registration. There are no excuses. Seize the opportunity to grow and learn at Wednesday Groups. Here's what we're offering this month. Group 1, Healthy Mind and Body. Learn from Anna and Harold Kelly, five-time Mr. Olympia, for physical wellness and Pastor Kareem Hickman for mental well-being. Get tips on diet and exercise plus wisdom on emotional wellness. Group 2, a Better Way to Pray. Hosted by two of our elders, Bob and Susie Leo. Dive into effective prayer practices for a richer spiritual life. Group three, Empowering Grace, a study from Ephesians. Join Cecil Robles and Collins Prem as we uncover the blessings of Christ and our identity as believers. Group four, Young Adults, Hang out with Cade and Jada Daly, Marcelino and Kyla Alfaro for a laid back social gathering. No agenda, just good company and coffee. Join us for growth, connection, and fun at Wednesday Groups. Jesus isn't just a Sunday affair. And at Calvary, neither is church. We love our worship. We love our message. We love our family. That's why we always have a lot going on for you and your family. Now, instead of bombarding you with info overload, why not scan this code? In just 30 seconds, you'll catch up on all the exciting things happening here at Calvary Church. When you scan this code, it'll direct you to our digital guide where you can explore what we have to offer for you. Now rest assured, we won't collect any of your information unless you opt to engage with something that interests you. Easy, right? Well, good morning, Calvary. It's so good to have you here this morning to worship with us at our 11 o'clock worship experience. And Kyla, it is so good to have you here. It's a pleasure and it's such a rare occurrence to have you joining me today. Thank you for being with me today. It's a joy. Thank you guys for being here today. If it is your first time with us today, maybe you're a first time visitor, would you do me a favor and scan the QR code that you see on the seat back in front of you? And if it is your first time, would you join me in, in just welcoming our guests today? Welcome to the family. Thank you for joining us online as well. And if you'll do me um, the pleasure of just taking a few moments, fill out those questions that you find on that um, form that you see on the QR code, and uh, it will help us get to know you better and help your experience today. And at the end of our 
service today, if you'll make your way out to the Welcome Centers in the lobby, you'll find um, people that would love to introduce themselves to you. We have a gift that we want to put in your hands, answer questions that you have. And we would love for you to take our three-week challenge. We understand that finding a church home can be a daunting task and trying to do that after one visit is nearly impossible. So we would ask that you would just give us a try for a couple of weeks, check us out, maybe try us out on a Wednesday evening, a couple Sundays, so that we can get to know you, you can get to know us, and you can make a decision about if this is the right place and the right fit for you. And uh, yeah, check us out. And um, yeah, is that all I've got right now? And oh, yeah, I also wanted to tell you that our pastor, Pastor Ben, is not here with us here at our Irving campus this morning. He is actually at our North Fort Worth campus. Um, he's ministering over there. He was here at our 930 service and then he ran over to our North Fort Worth, North Fort Worth campus, but he is only there for that service and then he's running back over here for a very special lunch that we have going on right after this service. And Kyle's gonna tell you a little bit about what's going on right following this service. Yeah, if you, it is your first time or you've just received the life of Christ or you'd like to get to know who Calvary is just a little bit more, we have Inside Calvary happening after the 11 a.m. after this service. Right. Um, this is a time where you get to meet our pastors, our elders, our staff. You just get to understand who Calvary is a little bit more. It's a free lunch. So if you are interested, scan that QR code, register. We'd love to see you there. We'd love to eat lunch with you. And, and we've, we've got childcare yes. available as well. Yes, so you have no excuse not to come. Um, another thing upcoming is camps. I'm super excited about camp. I love serving um, at our camps. Uh, Kids Camp is a two-day experience on June 22nd and 23rd. We are welcoming all ages between five and sixth grade, and we even have a a camp for our Champions right. Club. Right. And Students Camp is a four day overnight experience on July 13th through the 16th, and those are for grades six through 12th. And if you have any you have any questions or you need some more information about our early bird pricing, that ends this Wednesday. You can go out to our Welcome Center and meet with our Next Gen team for more information. That's right, any of the things that we've talked about this morning, you can find the QR codes to sign up for. Um, these events are Inside Calvary, uh, First Time Guests, any of these things. You can scan the QR codes on the digital guides out at the Welcome Center, and um, you can have all those questions answered for you um, right there. And in just a moment, we're going to step out on God's Word by faith and give through our generosity. But before we do, I'm going to just give you a quick update on our Building Legacy Project. Above our regular giving, this last month, we set a goal to raise $132,682. And this was to enhance this facility. This facility is 20 years old, and we want to uh, raise money to um, prioritize safety, accessibility, and comfort for you, for our church body, as well as for our visitors that come here um, that we minister to. And uh, this will enable us to install much needed updated HVAC systems, the replacement of carpeting in our children's area, upgrade outdated children's check-in kiosks. Parents, you know that we have a lot of updating to do with our, uh, our kiosks. We wanna create connection points from our parking lot all the way into our lobby areas. We have, um, a lot of different plans um, with this project and every aspect is designed to better facilitate community especially for our kids not just our kids but our our champions club that's our special needs ministry and these enhancements go beyond simply the physical improvements because they embody our vision of a church family where individuals of all ages all ages can flourish in their in their journey with Christ. So let's take a look at what has come in with our giving campaign. So far, we have brought in $96,227. That's what has come in so far this past month. 
that 72.5% of the, of the project has been completed. And what is remaining to come in to hit our goal is $32,453. And we want to see this project complete. And we wanna see it complete within this next month. We wanna see it before the summer hits. Because how many of you know that summertime gets hot and we need this air conditioning system to work? And that means we need to get new HVAC, we need the carpeting replaced, we need that check-in system working, and um, we need these other projects to get done. And uh, this project is not um, something that is going to just happen without our generosity, all of us working together. And this is above our regular giving. And so we're believing that we can get it done this month before summertime. So we're gonna keep bringing this before you every single week as, until this project is completed. And here at Calvary, we have multiple ways that you can give. We've tried to make it um, as simple as possible and as convenient as possible for you. And as we prepare our generosity, um, our hosts have come down. If you have not heard about our giving campaign, campaign, if you want to get involved, maybe you've already committed and maybe you feel that this is an area that you can continue to commit and make good on your promises and maybe you've already completed that commitment and maybe you feel led to go ahead and give again and continue until this project is complete. If you'll raise your hand, slip up your hand, um, the uh, host will get this brochure in your hand, maybe it's something you've never heard about and you want to learn more about it. Um, and as we prepare our generosity, um, we're just going to, I'm gonna read this passage, this uh, verse to you, and I want you to allow these words to build your faith today. This is out of Matthew 19, 29. It says, and everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or fields for my sake, will receive a hundred times more and will be given eternal life. This is Jesus talking. And this passage talks about sacrificing material goods for the sake of the kingdom. To those who do this, Jesus promises they will receive a hundred times more. That's a promise that he makes good on. You know, this morning, what if we actually believed these words? What if we really, really believed the promise that Jesus gave to us today? What if we believed enough to actually act on these words? And these aren't trick questions, it's not a rhetorical question, I'm, I'm, I'm really asking this. What if we really believed those words? If we knew that Jesus was telling us that our investment would be multiplied back to us a hundred times, would we really invest? If someone told you that the $10 invested would give us $1,000 back, would you invest it? If I said, hey, if you invest 10 bucks and I promise you, you will get $1,000 back, would you invest that? Obviously we would, right? Or if, if we invested $100, that would give us 10,000 back. Would we invest it? Yeah, we would. There's no doubt about it. If we're going to act on these promises, we've got to do three things. Number one, we have got to believe and trust Jesus' statement. Number two, and this is where a lot of people stop short, we must decide to take a risk. We've gotta take a risk. We can't just say that we trust and then stop because that's not really believing. Believing is acting. We must decide to take a risk. We've got to step out on God's word. And number three, we must recognize that we are not giving for our sakes alone. We're giving for Him. We're giving to Him. And He will keep His promise to us. Let me pray for you today as you give. Father, I thank you so much that you are a promise keeper. You're good to your word. I thank you, Lord, today that you stir our hearts. And Lord, as we prove you, you prove to us that you are faithful, you are good, and you will act on your word in our lives as we take bold steps of faith. I thank you, Lord, that you will bless our gifts. I thank you, Lord, that as we step out, 
that you will absolutely make right in our lives these sacrificial gifts and that Lord, you will prove yourself as true and that you will multiply the gifts back to the sowers. And so Father, I thank you in Jesus' name for abundant supply. You are our provision, you are our source. And I thank you, Lord, that you will take these gifts today and you will bless them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, church. time, sing it out, say, say, Jesus, Jesus, how I trust you, how I've proved you o'er and o'er. thankful for a faithful father put your hands together and give him praise right now oh you can do better than that if you're thankful for a good faithful friend give God some praise this morning well hello family in person and online if you do me grab your Bibles and turn to Hebrews 12 14 and 15 now I know I'm not pastor Ben might be confused. I'm his son, and before I dive into this message, I want to express my heartfelt gratitude to my parents for granting me this opportunity to stand before you today. I deeply appreciate the significance of this platform and the trust that they have put in me. My parents exemplify authenticity and sincerity, qualities that resonate with every single person that they meet. Their decision to entrust me with sharing the gospel today holds great meaning to me. And please, could you put your hands together and honor some of the greatest pastors in the world? My parents, Pastors Ben 
and Kim. Today we're continuing a series called Overwhelmed. If you've missed any part of this series, you can go back and watch it at calvarychurch.cc or on the Calvary app. During this series, we've been talking about the things in our life that seem to overwhelm us. Guilt, stress, discouragement. And today I want to talk about a big one, bitterness. In Acts 28, the Apostle Paul was on his way to Rome. He had just survived a shipwreck that stranded him along with all the other passengers on an island called Malta. The natives welcomed them and built a fire to warm their weary guests. Now Paul was reaching down to place some firewood on the fire when a viper slithered out of the wood pile, bit him and fastened itself to his hand. First nearly killed at sea and now bitten by a deadly snake. Just when he thinks that he's out of dangerous waters, snakes come out of the woodwork. Did he blame the natives for not snake-proofing the campsite? No. He shook it off into the fire. On our journey through life, we're going to receive some snake bites. And, and I'm not necessarily talking about physical snake bites from rattlesnakes or, or vipers. I'm talking about heart snake bites. The, the Bible refers to Satan as a serpent. And he wants to attach himself to our souls, to our, our hearts, our minds, so that he can inject his venomous poison. When the enemy bites, we can do one of two things. One, we can let him hang on. Or two, we can shake him off. One, we can let him hang on. Or two, we can shake him off. If we don't shake off the serpent, it'll continue to pump poison into our hearts. And don't ever forget, our hearts are the fertile soil where, where God's word, the seed, takes root. We have to cultivate and protect the soil of our hearts. And if we aren't careful, we allow the enemy access to our hearts. We can easily become bitter. A bitter heart is incredibly destructive. Look at Hebrews 12. It says that it'll spring up and cause trouble, defiling many in its path. Bitterness will cause untold trouble in our life. Unchecked bitterness has the capacity to wreak havoc in our health, in our minds, in our emotions, in our relationships, and I even think in our finances. Bitterness can cause a world of trouble that will pollute others around us too. A root of bitterness that began with one person has ruined whole families, right. companies, churches. And if you allow the enemy called bitterness into your heart, you'll only create more trouble for yourself and for those around you. When our heart becomes poisoned by the bite of bitterness, the eyes of our heart start looking at others differently. I don't think y'all heard that. When our heart becomes poisoned by the bite of bitterness, the eyes of our heart start looking at everyone else around us differently. When our hearts become bitter, we view others around us in a venomous way. That is why it is so vital that we forget those that have hurt us. Peter once asked Jesus in Matthew 18, Lord, when someone has sinned against me, how many times ought I forgive him? Once? Twice? As many as seven times? Now, I'm sure that Peter had someone specific in mind when he was writing this. Peter was kind of a hothead, and I'm sure that he'd reached his limit with whoever he was talking about. I'm sure that he'd kept track of all the offenses and had reached his limit of extending forgiveness. One time, Jesus? My God, two times? Seven times? Okay, that's it. But look at what Jesus answers with. Peter, you must forgive not seven times, but 70 times seven. In other words, every time. When the snake bites, shake it off every time. Jesus knew that forgiveness wasn't optional, it was essential. He said, to keep extending mercy 
to those who have hurt us. Each day brings new offenses requiring new forgiveness. Every time that we're offended, we must forgive. The fact is, we forgive, watch, for our own good. Forgiveness prevents the bite of bitterness from poisoning, watch, our heart. If we don't forgive, we allow the snake to inject its venom into our heart. Just as the serpent lied to Adam and Eve, he'll attempt to lie to us as well. He speaks to our hearts and our minds, trying to prevent us from forgiving others, holding us in bondage, keeping us captive and poisoning our hearts with bitterness. And a poisoned heart is a bitter heart, but bitterness does not instantly happen. Bitterness is a process which takes places in stages. And it starts with this, stage one, offense. Bitterness begins as a seed of offense. When you're offended, a negative seed is sown in your heart. Someone offends us. A friend betrays us. A colleague makes a devastating comment about our outfit at work. A family member wrongfully judges us. And it hurts, it hurts deeply. The enemy plants this thought in our mind that says, I'm offended by what he did to me. Offenses can be real or imagined. While some people intentionally set out to hurt us, others, more often than not, don't even mean to. Although their actions may be innocent, we get offended through our imaginations and through our assumptions. When someone hurts our feelings, Satan tempts us to become resentful. Every bitter person had his start through being offended by someone. And he chose, he chose to be offended. You know what's so interesting? Did you know that the word offense in Greek is the word scandalon? And a scandalon is the wooden stick in a trap where you place the bait that lures the prey. It's literally the wooden stumbling block of a trap. What a thought. Doesn't that bring a new meaning when you so quickly say, oh, I'm offended. You offended me. You are literally admitting that you took the bait and stepped right into the trap of the enemy. Jesus taught that it's inevitable that offenses will come our way. We might as well face it. We're going to be offended from time to time. It's one guarantee of life. You have death, you have taxes, and you have offenses. People let us down. This is something that we can count on. But we do not, how many of y'all are thankful that today we do not have to take the bait? If you're thankful for that, give God some praise. We must learn to act immediately during the offense stage, to forgive the offender. Offense is hurt, but we have a choice. We have a choice. We can acknowledge the pain, we can tend to our wounds, and we can forgive the offender. If we shake it off, we will maintain our freedom and our joy. But if you don't, that takes you into stage two, anger. If we hold on to the offense rather than shaking it off, it turns into anger. The enemy plants another thought. I'm still mad at what he did to me. Anger comes in many shapes and many sizes. Things don't go the way that we like. And we get angry. Someone lies to us, and we get upset. Our spouse violates our trust, and we're enraged. Ephesians 4, 26 says, if you are angry, don't sin by nursing your grudge. Look at that. If you are angry, don't sin by nursing your grudge. Don't let the sun go down with you still angry. Get over it quickly. In other words, don't allow your anger to fester. My God, the way I've learned this in my first year of marriage. My wife offends me. And I, boy, if only she knew. If she knew how well people would treat me. <laughs> if she knew. And I'm mad and I'm angry. She comes, she apologizes because she's a good wife. And then in my head, I'm going, no, you, you did something worse. I want more of an apology. She goes to the room. I'm out in the living room, I'm just sitting there, I'm, boy. I walk in, I bust through the door. 
She's asleep. She's not even thinking about it anymore. <laughs> and then I'm more mad. <laughs> now, if you're stuck in anger, it leads you to stage three. Unforgiveness. Unforgiveness is a prolonged anger and resentment. It drains the love out of our heart so that we view others with scorn. Now, we don't use that word much, but it simply means hatred. It's another way of saying hatred. The enemy plants another thought in our mind. I just can't forgive him. We've all heard of hate crimes, but call me naive, but I've never once heard of a crime called a love crime. Refusing to forgive is a hate crime. Let's call unforgiveness what it really is. It's hatred. And we don't like to think of it as that. We don't like to think of unforgiveness as hatred. Why? Because we want to justify our unforgiveness. We want to give a voice to our hurt, to our betrayal. We want to, to see secretly. We want to see the people who have hurt us punished and then wash our hands of the guilt. If we allow the venom of unforgiveness into our heart, we'll proceed to the final stage. It's what I'm talking about today, stage four, bitterness. The enemy plants the thought, I can't stand him, watch, I'll never forgive him. I'll never forgive her. Bitterness is the result of an unhealed wound. At this stage, our heart has been injected with poisonous venom, causing us to view others with hostility and with hatred. I recently read a story about an elderly woman. After she had passed away, family members were cleaning out her house. And while they were in the house, they found a scrapbook filled with obituaries from the local newspaper. Many were of people that she detested. As bizarre as it may sound, she kept a scrapbook of her dead enemies. Some of y'all laughing like you got one. That's okay. That's okay. This woman had five different clippings of her most despised foes in her morbid memory book. Apparently, she had gained some kind of strange satisfaction by thinking they could no longer torment her. But the reality was that each one of those enemies still held a grip on her heart long after they had left her life. If we don't forgive our enemies, whether they're still in our lives or not, they will continue to haunt us through our hateful memories of them. Someone once said, I will not let anyone walk through my mind with their dirty feet. Sadly, most of us not only allow others to walk through our minds with their dirty feet, but we also give them rent space, replaying those painful occurrences over and over and over and over and saying, man, I should have said this. It would have handled it. I would have been able to process it. No, you play it over. Holding it against them again and again with every remembrance. Truth be told, few people escape once they reach stage four because bitter people stay offended and they stay angry. They remain trapped inside the prison cell of their own making only through intentional repentance. Can these prisoners be set free? The bite of bitterness creates a stronghold that takes over a person's heart like a cancer. And, and when cancer is in stage four, it means that it's spread to other parts of the body. Bitterness is the same way. When it gets to stage four, it spreads like wildfire and affects every other area of your life. But you can overcome the bite of bitterness. You can overcome the bite of bitterness. If you're thankful for that, give God some praise. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Do you want to overcome bitterness? Do you want to live the life that you have abundant, a life free, a life full? The notes are available on the Calvary app. I want to talk about overcoming the bite of bitterness. How do we do this? Well, number one, shake it off. Shake it off. Jesus said in, in Matthew 5, you have heard the law that says the punishment must match the injury, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But I say, do not resist an evil person. What? Do not resist 
an evil person. If someone slap you on the right cheek, offer the other cheek also. Did you see that? Don't resist him who is evil. Now logic tells me that we should resist evil. Although it doesn't seem to make sense, Jesus specifically commanded us to not resist those who offend us. Remember, in this portion of Scripture, Jesus is preaching the law, law 2.0. He's driving the listeners to the ends of themselves. His point was, watch, you can't do it. If you could, you wouldn't need Jesus. When the snake strikes, don't strike back. Trust Jesus, the heart healer. We must not pick up the weapon of hate and retaliate against our enemies. The Bible says, Romans 12, never pay back evil with more evil. Returning evil for evil is the first step in the bitterness process. Instead of fighting, shake it off. When Paul shook off the snake, he suffered no harm. If you will learn to shake off offenses, you won't be harmed either. Things that used to hurt you won't hurt you anymore. You must not give the snake the slightest opportunity to poison your heart. Bitter people are are filled with a deadly poison because they've had a snake attached to them for way too long. Their hearts are full of venom because they didn't shake it off when when the snake first struck. As long as the snake is still attached, it will keep injecting poison. The longer you let it hang on, the more Venom will enter into your heart. That takes me to number two. Let go of offenses. Let go of offenses. Do you know how monkeys are captured? One of the ways is by setting up a container similar to this and placing bait inside. Now the monkey sees the food or the unusual object inside of the containers and if they're curious enough, They'll reach inside of the container and try to pull it out. Now, because the object is too large to go through the opening, the only way that the monkey can get away is to what? Drop the bait. Look at that. But the monkey refuses to let go. They scream, they kick. I'm not going to do an impression, but they just keep holding on. They stay strapped to bondage because they refuse to let go of the bait. Do you remember the Greek meaning of the word offense? It's the part of the trap where the bait sits to lure you in. Think about it. Have you grabbed the bait? Have you grabbed the bait? Have you taken that offense? Have you grabbed the bait? How many of y'all are walking around like this today? If you grab the offense, you'll be his prisoner as long as you hold on. Many people are prisoners in the enemy's trap simply because they refuse to let go. They refuse to let go of those offenses. Shake it off. Let it go. Hebrews 12.1 says, So we must let go of every wound that has pierced, pierced, pierced us and the sin that we so easily fall into. Then we will be able to run life's marathon with passion and with determination. For the path has already been marked out before us. In other words, we must get rid, pierced, we must get rid of every arrow tip in us. The implication in this verse is a warning of carrying an arrow tip inside, a wound that weighs us down. A wound that could so easily fester with infection and keep us from running our race with freedom. The writer of Hebrews, uh, probably Paul, knew how easily it would be to fall victim to offense if we didn't let them go. You cannot run the race of a lifetime with offensive wounds. Number three, be a forgiver. Bitter people need to get the venom out of their spiritual bloodstreams. Love is the anti-venom for hatred and forgiveness is the serum for the poison of bitter. Love is the anti-venom for hatred and forgiveness is the serum for the poison of bitterness. 
If anyone, if anyone in the Bible had the right to be offended, it was Joseph in the Old Testament. Now Joseph knew what it was like to be hurt by those closest to him. Genesis 37 tells a story, and I encourage you to read it in its entirety. He was favored. He was the favored son, and everybody knew it. Jealousy consumed his brothers as they saw a beautiful coat given to him by his father. A coat. His angry brothers planned to kill him by throwing him in a pit and saying an animal devoured him. Well, guess what? Then an opportunity arose to make some money to sell him into slavery. If anyone, if anyone had the right to be bitter, angry, betrayed, it was Joseph. Think about it. He'd been stripped down, thrown into a pit, left to die, then removed and sold into, his, into slavery all by his own brothers. Fast forward years and years later, after slavery and after imprisonment, Joseph ends up becoming the ruler of Egypt. It was during a, a famine that Joseph, his brothers, came to Egypt in search of food. Here was Joseph's chance, man, here it is. Here it is, here's his chance, he can get even. He could have made them grovel, he could have made them starve, he could have humiliated them in front of the entire nation. Yet Joseph did none of these things. His love was the antivenom for hatred, and his forgiveness was the serum for the poison of bitterness. Instead of punishing them for their evil deeds, Joseph extended grace upon grace, grace in place of grace, grace upon grace. He didn't want them to feel guilty for sending him to Egypt, but instead he assured them that it was God's plan. Look at Joseph's response, Genesis 45. And now, do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. I believe his response speaks volumes of the health of his heart. I believe he forgave his brothers years and years prior to that day. Joseph was a forgiver. He could have allowed unforgiveness to fester in a pit, in slavery, in prison, and let it turn into bitterness. But what did he do? He chose to forgive his offenders. He overcame the bite of bitterness. Now, I got good news for you today. You're not Joseph. You are not a picture of Joseph. He's an Old Testament picture of Christ. You could never do what he did. As New Covenant believers, on the Finnish side of the cross, we don't only forgive others to neutralize the poison of bitterness, but watch this, we also forgive because we ourselves have been forgiven of so much. If we truly receive God's forgiveness, that's what will flow from our heart. Ephesians 4.32 says, that we forgive just as God in Christ also forgave us. Lift your hands right now. We forgive. Open up your mouth right now and say thank you. Thank God. Just take a moment. Thank Jesus. Don't focus on yourself right now. Focus on Him. Thank you, Jesus. Allow the Holy Spirit to minister to your heart right now. Thank you, Lord. Focus on His forgiveness. <laughs> Don't focus on your lack of. Focus on His. Focus on His forgiveness. Maybe you've been bit by bitterness. You've been betrayed. Your heart, it hurts. It hurts deeply. And today, the Lord is right here. Psalm 34, 18 holds one of the sweetest promises. It says this, the Lord is close to all whose hearts are crushed by pain. That's many of you today. You've been holding on to something you can't let go. The Lord is close to all whose hearts are crushed by pain. And he is always ready to restore the repentant one. Now listen, repentant simply means to change your mind or your heart. Today, if you've allowed, if you have allowed offense 
anger, unforgiveness, to lead to bitterness. You can change your mind today. If you've been walking around with a container on your arm of bitterness, you can change your mind. The Lord's ready to restore your broken heart today. I understand it's not easy. Believe me, I understand. When you grow up in ministry, you get bitter. I understand it's not easy. You won't necessarily feel like forgiving, but today, simply receive God's forgiveness for you. As you do, you'll be able to forgive more and more based on faith that'll bring you freedom, not a feeling, based on faith that will give you freedom. It'll unlock the prison that you found yourself in. I know your heart's been crushed. I know. But don't build up walls to protect your heart from further pain. All you're doing is building a prison cell of your bitterness. Don't poison yourself any longer with a bitter heart. Receive God's forgiveness. Choose to forgive. And don't let the seed of offense become the root of bitterness. Don't play the blame game any longer. You are not a victim. Don't recycle revenge. Extend, listen, extend the forgiveness that you freely received. It's not your forgiveness, you're extending Christ's forgiveness that you have freely received. Start speaking healing words instead of critical words. If you can shake off bitterness, if you can shake off bitterness, you'll speed up your heart recovery. And I promise you, you're gonna save yourself a lot of heartache. Now, why am I dealing with the bite of bitterness today? Because I believe that today, some of you in this room, you are going to choose to forgive your offenders. You're going to choose to forgive your offenders today. And if that's you today, I really want you to listen to me. I have a prayer that we're all going to pray. We're all going to pray, not just you. We're all going to pray this prayer together. And I'm going to read it first. And I left a little spot blank in there. And listen, while I was going through these notes, that little blank line was filling up with names. I had about six lines of names that I was filling up. I want you to look at this prayer right now. Because I'm an overcomer, I'm going to read it first. I'm choosing to rid myself of all bitterness, all rage, anger, harsh words, and slander as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, I choose to be kind to others, tender-hearted, forgiving those who have offended me. Just as God through Christ, God through Christ has forgiven me. I choose to release my grip on, I don't know, I don't know who that is for you. I declare that he, I declare that she has no power over me or my thoughts today. I am free of the bite of bitterness. Church, are you ready to say this out loud? I'm gonna invite Pastor Kareem out here now. Ready? Read. Because I'm, stop. Apparently only six of you are bitter. We're all gonna read this together. Because I am an overcomer, I'm choosing to rid myself of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, I choose to be kind to others, tender heart, forgiving those who have offended me just as God through Christ has forgiven me. I choose to release my grip on everybody, and I declare that they have no power over me or my thoughts. Today, I'm free from the bite of bitterness. Clap your hands if you receive it. You're free. Now, while you're in the clapping mode, won't you give it up for Cade? That's a word right there, y'all. I think his future is real bright in this house and in the world. And Jada, why are you smiling so hard? Why are you smiling so hard? 
we're proud of him and thank God for the gift that he's placed on Cade. The Daly family is amazing. They're awesome. Aren't you grateful for them? Aren't you grateful for our lead pastors in the, the first family here at Calvary? Shake it off. Let it go and be a forgiver. Let's stand together. Before you dismiss, I want to share something very important. I want you to do something today. We have designated two welcome centers here in the lobbies. They're very important. They're important because we wanted to designate some spaces to connect with you and to answer any questions that you may have. We also wanted to designate space so that you can have easy access to our next steps. Whether you want to ask a question personally or digital access, you can easily access the giving opportunities. If you are a first time guest, there's a code for you for that. If you want to volunteer, if you have a prayer request, if you want to follow the Lord in baptism, it's very easy and it's posted right at our welcome centers. Also, when you go to the Welcome Center, you're going to see an opportunity that we call Inside Calvary. Well, guess what? That is actually today. In just a few minutes, we're headed over to the chapel and we're going to have lunch with our pastors. If you are new or you've been here for a long time and you want an opportunity to sit with our pastors, ask questions, hear vision, understand our values, this is the opportunity to do so. But if you want to go, you got to sign up right now. Right now, you've got to hit that code and you've got to sign up and we will be ready to host you. I'm looking forward to the day we do this bi-monthly and this is an opportunity for you to get an idea on what it's like to be a member. Inside Calvary, it gives you an idea on what it's going to be like to serve on one of our teams and it just gives you an opportunity to see what we're about. Calvary, we love you. If I don't see you at Inside Calvary, that means I'm going to see you Wednesday night at our Wednesday night groups, or it means I'm going to see you next week. Either way, I love you. God bless you. You are dismissed. And please stop by one of our welcome centers. God bless you. At Calvary, we believe that your generosity can transform lives. In today's digital era, giving online has become a favorite way for many people to practice generosity. It offers a safe and secure platform where individuals can contribute to Calvary Church and support the mission with ease. That's why we offer three convenient ways to give online, through our website, our mobile app, and via text message. If you prefer giving through our website, simply visit calvarychurch.cc and click on the giving section in the menu bar. From there, you can select your desired location, just like you saw in the live stream featuring our Irving location. Our website provides a user-friendly interface that makes the giving process smooth and hassle-free. For those who prefer giving on the go, our Calvary Church CC app is the perfect solution. Download it from your app store, tap on the give button, and choose whether you want to give online or at a specific location. Our app provides a convenient platform that allows you to contribute securely right from your mobile device. If you're looking for a quick and straightforward method, our text to give option is ideal. Simply send a text message with the word Calvary IRV followed by the amount you want to give to 833-245-6183. It's as simple as that. This method is great for busy individuals who are always on the move and want to make a donation without an extra step or browsing. We want you to feel confident in giving online, which is why we prioritize safety and security. Calvary Church takes necessary precautions to protect your personal and financial information. We also encourage you to consider setting up recurring giving. This allows you to make regular automatic contributions, which not only provide convenience for you, but also helps us plan for the future. With your ongoing support, we can continue our mission of declaring and demonstrating the gospel in a consistent and impactful way.